I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Expert Series. I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Abigail Marsh, a Professor of Psychology at Georgetown University, author of The Fear Factor, to speak with her about her work in psychopathy. So thanks for being here today, Abby. Thanks for having me. I was wondering if we could start by hearing a little bit about the kind of mental health work you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not a clinician by training at all. I find it sort of funny that I ended up doing work that is so clinically relevant uh, because it was not at all what I set out to do, but I am a big believer in serendipity and I think I'm doing exactly the right thing for me. So um, my interest is in empathy and compassion and why people care about other people at all. I find it sort of a beautiful miracle that we do, most of us. Um, but those are phenomena that are hard to study in the lab because they're so subject to social demand and um, it's hard to construct situations that people find believable that require somebody to make a, a genuine decision to help somebody else or not. So another way to approach questions like that is to use a clinical model to find people who are missing the um, phenomena you're interested in and try to see what's different about them. And we've learned a huge amount um, about all sorts of different phenomena this way. So, you know, studying people with amnesia to understand memory, studying people who have prosopagnosia to understand face processing. Well, I study people who have psychopathy to understand some things about empathy and compassion because um, they seem to be pretty much intact cognitively uh, in most respects, but they really just don't care about other people at all. Not deep down, not, you know, if we could just cause them to feel better about themselves, <laughs> that's not the problem. They really don't care about other people. Uh, so that's my main interest there. And how did you go about getting started doing this work? So um, after I completed my PhD in social psychology, uh, I was looking for a postdocs and discovered that James Blair, who's one of the preeminent um, psychopathy researchers in the world and one of the few people doing neuroimaging research on psychopathy, had just taken a new position at the NIH, National Institute of Health, in, um, outside Washington, DC, and was looking for new postdocs. And it was just, again, like such a serendipitous thing. It really couldn't have been more perfect. Um, and I, because I had wanted to learn brain imaging, um, I had been feeling a little hemmed in by the way that social psychology research was conducted at that time, although the field's changed a lot since then. Um, and so I did my postdoc and sort of retrained in uh, clinical research and neuroimaging and pharmacology and development and genetics. I mean, it was a huge four and a half years of learning for me, but it was fantastic. That's amazing. And so when you think about how you, when you first got started in this work and where you are now, what stand out in your memory as sort of notable challenges and difficulties um, as well as successes that you've been able to savor? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think anybody who's ever tried to learn something new is familiar with the feeling of failure and struggle that accompanies that um, journey. And I, I really vividly remember the first year of my postdoc. Here I have my PhD. I think I've got my smart credentials now. Um, I just couldn't believe how dumb I felt every day when I was starting my postdoc because I was everything I was learning was new. I knew nothing about anything. Um, and I appreciated so much all the patience that my um, lab mates and my mentor and all my co-mentors had just getting me up to speed. I also discovered how hard it is to do clinically oriented research. Um, you know, you're recruiting relatively rare populations of people who um, I was specifically focusing on recruiting kids who have psychopathic traits. And uh, they're really hard to recruit. There are not that many of them. And their families are really struggling a lot of the time with all the issues that come along with having a kid with these problems. And they don't have that much time for research. I don't blame them at all. And we couldn't even offer any treatment. So it was really, really difficult just getting people through the door uh, to be interested in doing research. There's, and psychopathy really suffers relative to some other disorders from a lot of myths and stigmas about it that I think um, make it so you can't even tell people what kind of research you're doing, you know? You, we really sparingly use the word psychopathy because it has such awful connotations. Um, now, to be honest, many of the parents that I've worked with over the years have used that word themselves to describe their children, but we, we generally don't use that, even, even that word to refer to children, but that creates a huge barrier to, um, to conducting research. So, I think overcoming myths and stigmas, both when dealing with research participants and working with them and trying to reach out to them and explain research to them, 
and also dealing with myths and stigmas with other researchers and the general public for sure in trying to communicate accurately about your science. Um, and then, you know, all research is hard, right? The, 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 if it was easy, you know, I don't think it would be nearly as fun to be totally honest. Um, but uh, for the most part, we were able to overcome. And what, as you look forward in the field, I mean, what do you see as the most important steps ahead? Um, I think mental health research is progressing at an incredibly rapid rate these days. I'm seeing increasing convergence among fields of psychology and neuroscience where it really is starting to feel like a maturing science where we're building our knowledge base across um, disciplines. And so the developmentalists and the social psychologists and the neuroscientists and the clinical psychologists are talking to one another and understanding each other's phenomena through the lens of research in different fields. And it really feels like we're making um, enormous progress right now in clinical research, um, it seems to me. We're really impeded by the limits of our technology in some ways. There's a lot of stuff we need to know about the brain that we cannot know, we cannot find out using the technology we have right now. I mean, understanding the brain means being able to measure and manipulate things at the level of the synapse, um, at the level of the neurotransmitter system. We can't do that right now. And, um, you know, the technology is improving so fast, I'm sure we will be able to, but sometimes it, it, it makes a person impatient. Sometimes waiting for the technology to emerge that will allow certain questions to be answered. And then my final question to you is, what advice might you have for people watching this interview today, maybe students, the public, um, who are interested in you know, the field and, and possibly getting engaged more? Gosh, I mean, what, what I really love about the kind of research I do is that there's so many roots in. Um, and oftentimes when I'm talking to students who are wondering sort of what's the best next step to take, after they're finished with their undergraduate degree. And what I love telling them is, you know what? There's a million different steps you could take, all of which have many, many options available to them. And you just have to take whatever is the, what you think is the next right step um, and, uh, and not worry too much about it limiting your options. Um, and I say this partly because as a postdoc, my lab was full of postdocs who had degrees in social psychology, clinical psychology, developmental psychology. One was a neurologist, an MD. Um, the people who had degrees in neuroscience who had, you know, went through a whole different kind of program than a main campus psychology program. So uh, what I think is cool is that there's lots of routes to get into doing this kind of research. Um, and it's important to just reach out to people whose research you think is interesting um, and be prepared to reach out to lots of people whose research is interesting because of course, um, you know, the, you never know what kind of lab will have a position open or what PI will uh, have some time to chat with you about your interests. Um, but my experience is that um, most people are excited to talk to people who are, all, who are similarly excited about the topic that they love um, and welcome expressions of sincere interest from people at all stages of training. Great. Well, Abby, this was wonderful. Um, thank you for such a wonderful overview of your career and, and for the advice to others watching this interview today. And thank you for the time speaking too. My pleasure, as always.